So, Amar, hello, Marta. Uh, so, you have this, the title there, Constraining Biogenesis in the Standard Model EFT, with DIM six terms using LAC, Higgs physics, and EDMs. I suppose you are going to explain all this in, in the talk. <laughs> Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Jorge, and thank you, the organize, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So yeah, indeed, let me start with the motivation for this talk. Uh, we have a very clear observable, which is the matter-antimatter uh, of the universe. Uh, we've been using CM, CMB measurements to extract the precise value of the baryon asymmetry, and it's given by this yb observed 8.59 plus or minus 0 0.04 times 10 to the minus 11 by Planck. Now, um, the standard model is on its own cannot um, provide uh, an answer to uh, why we have this value for the baryon asymmetry of the universe. And the standard model has two main problems. It, uh, it doesn't have a, a strong electroweak phase transition, a strong first order phase transition. And the second problem is that uh, it doesn't have a large enough CP violation. Over 50 years ago, Saharov uh, you know, gave us the ingredients. If we're starting from a, a universe that is um, symmetric in, in baryon number, um, your, your theory is going to need three ingredients. It's going to need a baryon number violation. Uh, is going to need to depart from thermal equilibrium, and you're going to need a C and CP violation. So evidently, we need to consider extensions of the standard model, which will incorporate these features, and uh, thus we could dynamically generate the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Now, once you um, modify your theory and you allow for uh, C and CP violation, well, this is going to have uh, consequences in other observables. In particular, um, new CP violating uh, terms will uh, generate uh, uh, electric dipole moments, for example, for the electron or for the neutron, etc. And there are experiments, very high precision experiments that have placed very strong bounds on these type of observables, like um, the ACME experiment has put, placed a bound on the EDM uh, to be um, the magnitude to be uh, 1.110 to minus 29 centimeters at 90% confidence level. Um, and the other uh, frontier that we're interested in is the energy frontier. So the LHC has resulted, of course, in the discovery of the Higgs and the measurement of its properties. So it is the only elementary spin zero particle. It is a scalar, and it seems to have standard model Higgs boson properties. Um, there are no other no elementary particles discovered up to a mass of around uh, one TV or so. So if we're considering new physics, then maybe the cause of the generating the baryon asymmetry of the universe, um, this the new physics scale associated to it may be high enough to be parametrized just by higher dimensional operators. So I'm going to take this approach of considering new physics by a high, higher dimensional operators. And I'm going to be using Higgs physics results from the LHC to constrain these higher dimensional terms. And in particular, I'm going to focus on only a subset of these higher dimensional operators, considering dimension six terms of um, made up by Higgs and fermion fields with uh, complex couplings. So. Run2 was a big, big success. Atlas and CMS have you know, um, been able to probe Yukawa couplings. Um, it really was the first time a Yukawa interaction was measured. And the plots on the left are just showing the great uh, consistency between the experimental results with uh, what is expected from the standard model Higgs boson. Um, down below, we're, we see really the uncertainties that are associated to these measurements of the Yukawa couplings, and it's precisely these uncertainties that can allow us to consider which type of new physics we may be able to still make and, and will be lying you know, hidden in, within those uncertainties and those measurements. Um, on the other hand, just, just to mention in very, for completeness, you know, the Higgs and the top mass values are, have very serious implications about the vacuum stability. And we still need to understand deeply what is the nature of the electroweak symmetry breaking and the electroweak phase transition. And 
to understand much more the Higgs sector, we need to really measure the, what is the Higgs self-coupling, and then this will be an insight to the electroweak symmetry breaking mechanism. Um, if we look at the projections you know, to the future, on the left here, we have the high Lumi LHC projections for measuring um, you know, um, Higgs uh, Yuka, uh, Yukawa couplings. Um, you see the, there's a reduction in the uncertainties uh, in these uh, Yukawa couplings, as you can see by the blue bars in comparison to the green bars, which is using the, you know, the initial um, before the high Lumi LHC uh, integrated luminosity. Um, and, but still, there's going to be room there, and we want to see what are the, the consequences of that. And with respect to the, the scalar potential um, at a high luminosity, you will be able to exclude a zero value for the self-coupling of, of the Higgs. Um, so let me uh, briefly lay out the, the standard model effective field theory framework. Uh, we have in the standard model a Lagrangian that's truncated at dimension four, and here I'm just going to add on dimension six terms with a real and imaginary uh, Yukawas uh, to the Lagrangian. And then those are the only uh, terms that I'm going to be considering throughout the rest of the talk. So adding this type of term that is suppressed by one over lambda squared in this equation, it's going to allow for new CP violating interactions, and it's going to change uh, the relation between the fermion mass and the corresponding Yukawa coupling. Um, so what's going to be very useful is just for me to introduce these two parameters, TRF and TIF, which are just the ratio of the dimension six to the dimension four contribution to the fermion mass. So they're given by these two expressions down here in the, in the box on the, on the bottom. So let's just keep these in mind that they are ways of parameterizing this uh, additional um, terms in the in the Yukawa on the Grangian. So uh, once we go to the to the real mass basis, then the expression for the fermion mass is going to be given by this first equation up here, and the expression for the Yukawa coupling is going to be given by this lambda f. So it's going to have a real component, and then it's going to have a, a complex, uh, an imaginary component. Um, and just keep note that the ratio of yf to yf standard model squared is just given by one over um, one plus tfr squared plus tif squared. And this is just going to be useful as we, I present the results further on. So we're going to use the experimental results to constrain the complex few uh, couplings that I just introduced in this uh, EFT. And we're going to be uh, looking at the contributions to the producing of very asymmetry, the contributions, um, how the Higgs production and decay rates at colliders are modified due to these terms, and contributions to EDMs. So let me the very briefly um, go through the basics of uh, electroweak um, baryogenesis. Uh, in this case, we're starting with an initial plasma uh, that's hot. Uh, that has a zero net variant number and electric symmetry is, is valid. But as the universe is expanding and cooling around the temperature of 100 GeV, an electroweak phase transition is going to occur and bubbles of the new broken phase are going to nucleate and fill, expand and fill the universe. And so we're going to be very much considering what happens to the plasma particles that have CP violating interactions with the bubble wall um, as this uh, bubble is you know, created and, and expanding. And um, we're going to have uh, a requirement that during the electric phase transition, uh, this happens through a strong first order phase transition and thus spheron transitions will be broken, will be suppressed in the, um, in the broken phase. So the assumption uh, that I'm going to make, and I'm not going to speak more about the electric phase transition, is just that we're going to have new degrees of free freedom, which are orthogonal to uh, the uh, extension of the Yukawa Lagrangian uh, that I uh, introduced, that are going to be the ones that are responsible for generating this strong first order electric phase transition. Um, and I'm going to assume that these will not affect the CP violating interactions of the bubble wall with the fermion in the fermions in the plasma. And I'm also going to assume that these new sources of CP violation, um, that the, these new degrees of freedom do not have uh, additional CP violation. 
Um, but just uh, to keep, keep in mind that there are very important parameters that come into the final calculation of the baryon asymmetry um, that are related to these uh, features that are given by the electrophase phase transition, phase transition, such as the wall velocity or the wall width. Um, that need to be obtained in a specific model that are that are consistent. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking some benchmark values for these two um, parameters and using the inputting them in the analysis and in the results that I'm going to be obtaining. So let me go over quickly what are the main processes that are occurring to produce the baryon asymmetry. So you have the charge fermion plasma particles with CP violating interactions with the ball with the wall and they're going to be generating a chiral asymmetry. While at the same time, you have CP conserving interactions that they are trying to continue to equilibrate the different particle uh, densities and they're washing out the generated asymmetry. You're going to have strong spalaron processes that are going to further wash out the, uh, the asymmetry in the quark sector. Um, but the remaining asymmetry is going to diffuse and it's going to diffuse in the, into the symmetric phase. And diffusion is affected mainly by gauge interactions, and it's mostly the leptons that are going to be uh, efficiently diffused into the symmetric phase. Um, then we have weak spalaron processes that are occurring in this symmetric phase, and they are uh, changing their number. And that uh, change is going to generate a preferred direction for the weak, from the weak spalaron and generate a final uh, value of the uh, baryon asymmetry. And in the end, what happens is that the bubble wall continues to expand and catches up and freezes in the resulting value of the baryon number density in the broken phase. So to, to actually do this, you need to solve a, a complicated set of a couple equations that are um, you know, concisely given by this expression here in black. And in, in practice, we're going to be using what is called the diffusion approximation, uh, in which the left-hand side, we can write up just as a, a two terms, um, one of them that is going to be uh, proportional to the, the wall velocity, and the second one, which is proportional to the diffusion constant. And right here on, on this, can you see my mouse? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, right here on the right, uh, all the way on the right, we're going to have what is the CP violating source term, the one that is generating the, um, the asymmetry in the different particle um, uh, in number densities. Um, and these, this source term and the relaxation and you call it terms are actually coming by this type of diagrams in which you have a fermion interacting with the bubble wall in, in certain um, moment in space time, and um, then it's interacting again at a different moment. And this is going to be giving you really the source term, and it's going to be proportional to the imaginary part of the product of MF star times MF prime. And this is going to be uh, uh, proportional itself to just YF squared times TIF. So similarly, um, we can calculate all the other terms in the uh, in this um, couple set of coupled equations. You have the relaxation terms. You'll have the Yukawa terms. You have the strong spalaron and the weak spalaron. Um, and you need all of these ingredients to generate the final value of the baryon asymmetry. Um, there are going to be changes in the CP even rates from um, um, like like I'm describing um, here when we have the addition of these uh, dimension six terms. So um, the relaxation terms gamma m are going to be modified by this prefactor to the, um, the standard value, value of gamma m, which is CP conserving. Um, and just here note that r and naught is just a ratio of the VEV at the nucleation temper temperature over the VEV at zero temperature. And similarly, the Yukawa rates are going to be modified in this way. Um, and so if I go to a simple case in which I take TRF equal to zero, um, I can write um, the final value of the baryon asymmetry, um, you know, in which we've you know, chosen what is the observed value, this 8.6 times 10 to the minus 11, times uh, the sum of three terms. Imagine if we had uh, contributions from the top, from a top source, from a tau source, and a bottom source. And so this gives you the relative um, contributions from each one of them. 
If you chose only one of them, then you can estimate what would be the magnitude, the order of magnitude for each one of them. So uh, below here in blue, I'm just showing which are the, um, the, the, what is the order of magnitude that these different TIs should have. Um, similarly, you can calculate uh, what is the, um, what are the EDMs. In this case, the contributions from these dimension six terms to the EDM. So you have, again, for the top, for the bottom or for the tower and the muon, these are the full expressions um, that you can calculate. And again, just plugging in numbers, you can show then that the uh, electron EDM can be given by the maximum value, uh, absolute value of D, plus these three contributions, say if we're considering only third generation fermions. So again, here you, we can see that if we're fitting for the, um, the, the measurement from ACME, the, the order of magnitude for TI top, TI tau, and TI bottom is given, given down here in blue. So let me now move on to colliders. So uh, again, we're gonna have modifications to the Higgs production and decay mode. So we have the usual diagrams for Higgs production. Um, and the signal strength is going to be modified then by the cross section times the branching ratio to a given final state. Um, um, and it's uh, divided then by the standard model value. And it's very convenient for us to define this quantity R sub F, which is just uh, the ratio of uh, lambda F squared over lambda F standard model squared um, to the ratio of the masses. And it's this. This RF is given again by this very simple expression in terms of TR and TI. So if we look at the production rates, um, only the gluon-gluon fusion and the TTH uh, cross sections are modified and they're gonna be given by this RT while the other um, um, cross sections are just the same. They just are, remain the same as in the value, value as in the standard model. Uh, the decay rates, they're going to be mo modified to be equal to, to, to RF for the bottom, the tau, and the muon, for example. And the total width is also going to be modified. So now this is the new expression for the total width um, uh, normalized to the standard model value. So we use all of these different measurements from uh, LHC, from both ATLAS and CMS for different um, um, center of mass energies and luminosities. And we, um, you know, we then determine what is the experimental values or we use the experimental values of the signal strength for each one of these uh, decay channels. And similarly with all processes from the top, but I've not included the details of those um, um, experimental inputs. So just consider for a moment the case in which we are, have a single flavor. So then the signal strength is just gonna be given by in general, just by RF uh, divided by one plus the branching ratio in the standard model, multiplying RF minus one. And it turns out that this defines a circle in the TRTI plane, which is given by this equation here, down here. So it turn, it, what the point I'm trying to make here is just that you can still have the single str signal strength equal to one and have values for both TR and TI if different from zero, independent of the value of the branching ratio um, in the standard model. So let me um, then now consider the case when you have more than one flavor, when you consider two flavors, uh, you will have different uh, possibilities. You can have either uh, the production cross section remains the same as in the standard model and you're only modifying the decay process or vice versa, you have a modification to the production cross-section and the decay is just as in the standard model. And so for that case, um, the, the relevant signal strength is given by this expression A. And you could also have the case in which both the production and the decay are modified. And so uh, the relevant equation for the signal strength then is in this case given by this equation B. So, what are the, the main features in the single flavor case? Um, both the Bernoulli symmetry and the electric dipole moment are both gonna be proportional to uh, the ra ratio of YF squared times TIF, except for the top quark. And that means that in, if I'm gonna make plots in the TI, T, TI, TR plane, 
the contours of the um, observed value of the baryon asymmetry are also, uh, not the observed, the, the, the contours of the baryon asymmetry are also contours of the um, EDM. Um, for uh, a top source, the uh, baryon asymmetry YB is approximately constant in TR top due to the large value of the Yukawa coupling and that's contributing to its thermal mass. Um, for the other flavors, the dependence of YB on TRF is mild, but negative values of TR are going to generate a larger value of the baryon asymmetry. And again, we're going to have mu f equal one to find a circle through the standard model point um, Ti and Tr equal zero. And so the experimental bounds are going to constrain these dimension six operators uh, and limit the, the, re the available regions and parameter space in the Ti TRF plane. And I'm going to be showing this. So let's consider first the bottom part. In this case, um, we have all of the possible constraints that from the colliders and the, are the blue lines from the decay of Higgs to, to a pair of, of, um, of these. Um, so the available, the allowed region is anything between these two circles. Um, on the other hand, in yellow, we have the constraints coming from the electric dipole, dipole moment. So you need to live within these yellow, these two yellow lines to be consistent with the value of the electric dipole moment. And then you look and see what is the value of the produced uh, baryon asymmetry. So in this case, uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing is that even for the maximal allowed value that you can get for TI and TR from uh, the constraint coming from colliders, you're only producing about 0.3 of the observed value of the baryon asymmetry. If I go to the top case now, here we have the corresponding plots again in blue. These are the collider constraints. The baryon asymmetry, you can produce it uh, to get a large enough value of the baryon asymmetry, but you are in a region that is outside the allowed region of the EDM. And I'm just gonna zoom into this so that you can actually see that if, I, if, if we try to sit within the allowed region of the EDM, and the allowed region coming from colliders, you're only producing a small percentage of the uh, observed uh, baryon asymmetry. Um, let's look at the, at the muon for, for a moment. You can easily show that this equation that's here in red will hold. So that means that if the, the EDM is, um, is, uh, is just takes on the value that the limit from the experiment, then you will definitely be able to produce um, a large enough uh, baryon asymmetry. That means that the EDM is not producing a strong constraint on the um, produced baryon asymmetry. On the other hand, if you look at, at the colliders, initially Atlas and CMS only produce upper bounds on the, on the signal strength of the decay of Higgs to, to mu mu, and this is what we are plotting here. So now I'm here in the TITR plane, and, and this is the upper bound that's coming from the colliders, this circle right here. And if I look at, and I you know, just place myself on these kind of maximum value for, for TI and TR, I get the maximum possible baryon asymmetry that's being generated. And it's only 1.4 times 10 to the minus 11. And uh, as I said before, it's easily shown that the EDM constraint is, is fulfilled. So, what is interesting in this case is that it's the, uh, the, the collider bound of a CP even observable that is limiting the maximum allowed value of a CP odd observable, which is the baryon asymmetry. Um, uh, later, more recently, Atlas and CMS up updated their, their measurement of the signal strength. And so now there's also uh, a lower value. And so it would just generate another circle within this um, circle that I have on the right. I'm not gonna show that. So again, let me just make this point very clearly. You have this CP even observable, which is the signal strength. And um, we can show two things from this, that the, from the experimental results, that the effective muon Yukawa coupling is not dominated by non-renormalizable terms. And on the other hand, that it's this CP uh, that it's constraining the CP odd observable, the baryon asymmetry that is produced, and that the maximum allowed value that you could produce is only around 16% of the observed value of the baryon asymmetry. 
So let me go to the Taos. This is the, uh, the, the same type of combination of constraints in the, the TITR plane for, for the Taos. And in this case, we can see this green region here in which all constraints are satisfied. So you have, if you are below this red line, you have a large enough rarity symmetry, you are satisfying the EDM constraint and you are within the allowed region um, from uh, the measurements at colliders. And again, keep in mind that you can have the circle that cuts right through this origin here of, um, and, and, and you can still have the signal strength be exactly equal to uh, the standard, mo standard model value. And uh, that circle will cut across into this region in which you are able to uh, satisfy the other two constraints as well. So when you combine um, sources, so suppose you have now a source from the top and the bottom, then Five if you look at the if you, look at the, if you look at the plot on the on the right, then you see the combination of all constraints from colliders, from the uh, EDMs, and to have a large enough variant asymmetry. This is also shown here on the left. I'm going to speed up a little bit. So you see that you really can't uh, um, satisfy all, all constraints at the same time. Um, however, if you look at combinations of the tau and the bottom, then you have this allowed region here in green. And you can actually generate a value of almost eight times the observed value of the variant asymmetry. Um, and similarly, uh, if you combine the, the tau and the, and the top, you're also going to have an allowed region in the, of the TI uh, top and TI tau plane. And in, these, in both these um, cases, I'm, I'm showing um, values of TR equal to zero. Um, so you can have standard model uh, solutions in which you can, um, standard model-like solutions in which you can have the observed value of the variant asymmetry, you still have an uh, EDM that's essentially zero, and you can, um, you can uh, um, yeah, have a signal strength that is uh, standard model-like. So let me continue. Um, and I'll just brief recap. With two flavors, you can produce the, the variant asymmetry of the universe without any de deviation in the signal strength. You would not have a uh, safety violating signal from a single EDM, but uh, will there be other constraints from other EDMs? Um, it's very important, again, to reiterate that the variant asymmetry and the EDMs are additive have additive contributions from the different Yukawa couplings, while the signal strength measurements at colliders are, are flavor specific. And so in this case, the CP violation and uh, Higgs to tau tau decays are going to be able to determine, would, should be able to determine the TI uh, tau by measuring angular distributions of uh, the decays of uh, Higgs into pairs of tau leptons. Now, CMS actually looked at the tau CP mixing angle, and these are some results uh, from here. And you can see here, which is the value the, the, the allowed from the experiment on the, on the mixing angle. Or if you look at it in terms of these parameters that essentially are uh, similar to the TI and to, to TI, this K tau tilde is essentially equal to TI tau. Um, and um, the, the point that I want to make here is that uh, the experiments do not put a, make a stronger constraint than what the EDM constraint makes on the, in the case of the tau. Um, let's, let me just kind of uh, recap also what are the implications for the effective uh, new physics scale. Um, so you get upper bounds on TI and TR from colliders and EDMs, and these translate into a lower bound on lambda. And uh, from producing the observed value of the Baroness symmetry, you get a, a lower bound on the, on the TI. And in particular for TI tau, it needs to sit in this range. And so you get an upper bound on the new physics scale lambda. Now, I didn't talk at all about flavors, but if you assume uh, there is flavor symmetry, like minimal uh, flavor violation, then what happens is that the TIs in the lepton sector are going to be equal. And it turns out that the electron contribution is to the EDM is, makes TIE be very, very suppressed. 
And so that will, at the same time, then make Ti tau suppressed, and so it's going to constrain the bowel from a tau source. So if a minimal flavor violation happens, then the tau will, will not be able to uh, generate the asymmetry. Um, but we can look at, you know, in general, uh, all of the constraints coming from all fermions at this table makes a nice summary. And it turns out that you can all also look at um, the contributions of, of the electron and the top to the um, electron EDM, and they can actually cancel out. And so you can actually find a region here in which you have a large enough variant asymmetry to the right of this line being produced by the top and the cancellation of the EDM by the electron. And so you have a region in which you can satisfy both um, the, um, the top, uh, the variant asymmetry and the EDM constraint in this case. So the conclusion is that you, you can produce a variant asymmetry with only a tau CP violating source. The CP violating sources from the top and the bottom cannot provide a large enough variant asymmetry due to the electric dipole moment uh, constraint. The CP violating source from the muon cannot produce a large enough variant asymmetry, but the constraint is coming from the collider constrained in the decay of Higgs to a pair of muons. When you have multiple CP uh, violating sources, then you can have some cancellations of the EDMs while at the same time enhancing the value of the um, variant asymmetry that you can obtain. And the smoking gun for the tau CP violating source is a measurement of CP violation of Higgs boson decays to tau leptons. So, thank you. Thank you, Marta. So, uh, uh, do you have some questions? Yes, uh, uh, Nicolas. Thanks, Martin, for this very nice talk. So I have a question. Um, so you have the different CP violation sources. I mean, uh, but do you expect, uh, well, I, I think that you don't expect them to be completely independent, right? I mean, a full, uh, say, UV complete model. So. Yeah. So again, what I, what I was trying to show today was, you know, the cases in which, you know, they are completely independent and what happens if you could have only one of them, what would happen? And then maybe if you had two of them, but they're not necessarily correlated. And then in the just last part, I made this note of, you know, if you had some kind of a symmetry among them, like that coming from minimal flavor violation and a specific UV completion that would allow for that, then you, then you run into trouble um, uh, because you're getting a lot of suppression. For example, in this case, I was showing uh, the contribution to the electron EDMs from the electron CP violating source, and that would be, you know, make it be like on the order of 10 to the minus three. We can show you in the table. And then that will, that would kill um, here. You see it's 2.2, 10 to the minus three. So then the tau source needs to be on the same order, and then it's much too small to produce the variant asymmetry in that case. And yeah, so it does depend on the UV completion model. But in the case I, am, I was considering, I was not making any assumptions on the, of that in general. Okay, I see. Thanks. Okay, Cheng. Hi, Marta. Hey, Hi. Thanks for the this uh, exciting. Uh, talk. Uh, I have a question, uh, uh, quite general question. Uh, can you comment on the uh, theoretical uncertainty of uh, uh, biogenesis uh, calculation? Yeah, so the, there are different ways to make this calculation. What I was showing here today, we did the calculation in the VEV insertion approximation. There are other, there are other ways of doing this, but the maximum um, uncertainty that we see that using the different mechanisms or methods to do this is about uh, uh, order one. So it doesn't have very strong implications. So the final results that I'm showing here. Okay, thanks. Okay, next question, Diego. Hi, Marta, thanks for the talk. Uh, I am wondering about the um, uh, 
specific bio, biolation in bio number required for biogenesis because from the tau it's expected um, more yeah, usually the lepton number biolation. This is pointing to something related to the leptogenesis or something like that? No, 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 no. Here, what we are generating is a, a chiral asymmetry um, through the CP violating interactions of the fermions with the bubble wall of the phase transition. Mm -hmm. And then it's the weak spalamel that is making that into a variant number. Okay, thank you. Okay, some more questions. Rogerio. Hey, hey, Marta. So thanks for the nice talk. Can you go back to the results on the uh, cutoff lambda that you obtained? Yeah. Okay, so, um, right. So, so, so really, uh, you're pointing towards uh, very uh, heavy new physics states. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and another question is relate, well, not related, but in your Lagrangian, uh, where you modify uh, the Higgs coupling to the uh, top, for instance, you generate a new vertex, uh, which is a TT bar Higgs Higgs. Um, that can uh, actually be interesting because uh, uh, for double Higgs production, that can be uh, important. No, that's right. We so, didn't look at that, but it's, that's correct. Yeah, yeah that's so that, that'd be interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Some one thing questions? that, yeah. yeah yes. one, oh, sorry, there's another question. No, Martha, okay, continue. No, no, one thing that I didn't get asked, but, uh, here is, this is an interesting prediction and me measuring the CP violating angle in the taos. If you look at future colliders, um, and this is the current constraint coming from the LHC, it's in, in gray here. And then the, these are the, what you would expect um, in future colliders. And the, the reason it's interesting is because you would be able to go down to a 95% confidence level for very, very small values in the angle, very close to, to zero. And you know the minimum value you need to produce, for example, in the case of just a tau, is around six or uh, seven degrees to be able to generate the variant asymmetry. So it is interesting that you are getting close to being able to, you know, to exclude this completely in the future. You cannot do it at the LHC, it's clear. Questions? Rogerio? Sorry, I have another question, sorry. Um, so from your conclusions, it seems that uh, if you have a single flavor, uh, you cannot uh, pass all the uh, constraints. So you need the multiple, no, I'm wrong. You're wrong, the tau can. The tau can. Yeah, okay. the tau is great. And that's why you want to make sure you look at that mixing, look for that mixing angle. Okay, and, and for, for that, you don't need any, okay. Because I was under the impre impression that you need some cancellations. No, uh, no, no, not with, with the, the if, you have a single, if you have a single flavor, the towel will do the job. Okay. Cannot yeah, enough. and All right. again, this, if, let me go back to the towel for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, here. This is the this is the just a tau. So this region you can you can do it. It's the EDM that's giving you the strongest constraint on the largest value you can obtain for the variant asymmetry, and it's much much stronger from the EDM than what you can get from uh, measurement of the CPA mixing angle at colliders right now. Okay. And it will only be in the future that you will be able to be very competitive. Okay, so only with the tau you can you can generate uh, biosymmetry and, and and respect EDM without any cancellations. Yeah, any cancellations. I also showed you know the 
the top and the electron, they can have a cancellation and then the top would be able, and you don't have to have the tiles. So you can also look at, at the mixing angle in the tops, from the tops, because you need a minimum value of this TI. And this is necessary a mixing angle that you need to measure. CP okay. mixing. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Marta, it has to the, the mass of the of, of the tau has, has something to do with this. Why, why the tau? Yeah, so it is uh, the the Yukawa is 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 large enough um, that it allows you to produce you know the barony symmetry without having all the the suppression that comes from strong interactions. So it, it, uh, that's that's the big advantage of the of the lepton, the tau, because the 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 muon is the yukawa is too small. Oh, okay. Okay. Some more questions. No, no. I remember that when you have this. Uh, a bionasimity through the anomaly, you can get some, some other effect too. You are not uh, including the anomaly? Which anomaly? The, the anomaly when you have in the in, in the standard model, you can generate uh, in, in some action anomaly that involve the, the bionasimity. Yeah, so this is this this is the spharon that you that you it's at high temperatures. You can have the spharon transitions, which are the ones that are converting the chiral asymmetry into a baryon asymmetry. Okay, so you're using this explicitly. Yes, exactly. I didn't go through all the details, but it's in one, the equations. There is a term there that is, you know, the one that's responsible for generating that. Okay, 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 thanks. One more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, let us thank Marta again. Thank you, Marta. Thank you.